Sentinel Control System Companion, 700 credits. Before the Great War, the geniuses at West Tech and General Atomics International had an idea. What if they combined unmanned suits of power armor with autonomous artificial intelligence? Their single, highly experimental prototype was eventually recovered by the Brotherhood of Steel, and now it's in your hands. Not quite robot, much more than human, the Sentinel Control System will shift the balance of power on any battlefield. Also comes with two new unlockable power armor paint jobs. Sounds interesting, but is it worth 700 credits? Let's find out. The next time we arrive in the Commonwealth, we begin the quest Malevolent Malfunction. Follow the radio distress signal. We pick up a new signal called the Distress Signal Beacon. Tuning to it on our Pip-Boy radio. Nothing. Just static. I see this must be one of those signals that gets stronger as we get closer to the source of the signal. Much like the transmitters carried by the Brotherhood of Steel or the Courser chip that brought us to Green Tech Genetics. But in both of those cases, we heard a beeping sound and we got a message on our screen telling us that the signal was getting stronger as we got closer to it. But as you can see here, I just hear static. We don't see any signal strength indicator on the screen, and if we try to show the location of the quest on our map, it shows us our own location. So it places no marker on the map showing us where to go. Essentially, we know there's a signal out there, but we have no idea where it is. We now have to just run around the Commonwealth to find this thing. Well, my player home is at the Kingsport Lighthouse on the far eastern shore of the Commonwealth. I figured I'd start by just running west. I ran and ran and ran, heading due west the entire time, meeting minimal resistance along the way, until I reached Dark Hollow Pond. And finally, I picked up the distress signal. Distress signal strength 0.21%. I had to walk almost to the middle of the map before I finally picked up the signal. But now that we know the signal strength, we can at least follow it to its source. I continued due west and the signal got stronger and stronger. Passing through Concord, the signal strength was 57.2%. But here, if we continue west, the signal gets weaker. It dropped down to 53.5%. So at this point, I knew I had to change direction. I started going south, and the signal began to grow stronger again. 61%. 69%. I was well into the 90s when I reached a military checkpoint on the train tracks where we find that suit of power armor, but there was no activity here. But facing south, we see a firefight off in the distance. Racing forward, we find a Brotherhood outcast? Both of those soldiers were wearing Brotherhood Outcast power armor. We haven't seen that for 10 years. Not since the Outcasts came back into the fold after Elder Lions. But these Outcasts were being escorted by a Brotherhood Vertibird. And since I made enemies of them in my game, I had to get rid of it.
Well, we have found the source of the signal. Now to find that transmitter. On the ground, we find the corpse of the outcast we just killed. But this is called a rogue sentinel. But where's the body? The head is completely gone. On the wreckage, we don't find a corpse. Instead, we find a full set of T-45 power armor with a brand new outcast paint scheme. It says, look up failed here in my inventory due to a mod conflict. In your game, this will say Brotherhood Outcast Paint Scheme. And we find the Sentinel System Log. Sentinel System Log. Log event 1, 1.21 p.m. Continuing patrol route, maintaining escort formation. Voice print, Vasquez. Damn, it's hot. Voice print, Maria, I know. Only a few more hours until we've swept this sector. Still with us, Dawson? You haven't said a word all day. Voice print, Dawson, sorry. Lost in thought. In the next one, 2.56 p.m., activating new targeting protocol. Authorization, Scribe Dawson. Voice print, Vaquez, what the hell? No! Maria, unintelligible. System log, threat status eliminated. Sentinel-1 new directive, escort Dawson. Target destination, Schult Propane Station Sector 10. Sentinel system 2 and 3 entering standby mode. Proximity defense enabled. So this is a log of events that happened earlier today. But what could this mean? Continuing to explore the battle site, we find the wreckage of another rogue sentinel power armor. Again, no body inside. We find another full suit of Brotherhood Outcast painted T-45 power armor, but this time no holotape. There's another Brotherhood corpse here. He likely fell from the vertebrate. And facing north down the road, we find the corpse of Vasquez. He's wearing a full suit of T-45D, which is interesting. Don't the Brotherhood typically wear the T-60? And on his body, we find Vaquez's holotape and a new toy car. Reading the holotape first, we see that his name was Gail Vasquez and he was a scribe. First entry, patrol sucks. It's not the weight of the gear that gets you, or the heat of the sun, or even cleaning your rifle for the bajillionth time. It's the sweaty drawers, man. Everything starts to rub the wrong way. What I wouldn't give for a washing machine while on patrol. Jiminy crickets. In the next one, birthday. Dawson's birthday is coming up next week. I found a toy car out on patrol. I know he collects that kind of stuff. I don't get it, but I guess everyone needs a hobby. Oh, so that explains the toy car we found. Inspecting it in our inventory, it is clean and new. A nice teal paint job with a yellow stripe down the middle. Stamped. Number 23. I think I know a little boy who might like this. Turning east, we see scorch marks and fires burning all over the place. We didn't cause these. These are the remains of a previous battle. Turning east, we find another corpse, Maria. And by her body, the outcast distress pulser. By looting it, we forever turn off the distress signal beacon. On Maria's corpse, we find Maria's holotape. Maria Harper, Brotherhood Knight. Mission summary. We have been assigned to patrol Sector 11 of the Commonwealth for a duration of 23 days. Our unit is supplemented by three Sentinels, AI-controlled power armor escort units. They're a little beaten up and still bear the paint of our outcast days before Elder Maxon, but they'll help get the job done. We're to report in via radio at 2100 hours daily with any noteworthy discoveries. All right, the story's starting to come together. So nearly a decade or so ago, the Brotherhood outcasts in the Capital Wasteland discovered these pre-war AI-controlled power armor escorts. That's why we didn't find any bodies in the other two suits of outcast power armor that attacked us. They were controlled by artificial intelligence. The outcasts were likely saving this technology for an upcoming confrontation with Lyons Brotherhood of Steel, but after the death of Elder Lyons and the appointment of Elder Maxon, they no longer found that battle to be necessary. Elder Maxon opened his arms and accepted the outcasts back into the Brotherhood. Now the Brotherhood of Steel has this outcast technology, but it still bears the paint of the Brotherhood outcasts. They were out on patrol with these AI-controlled units when clear something happened. To find out, let's keep reading. Next note, day four. A cache of military fusion cells was discovered near an abandoned shed, including this in the daily report. Morale seems to have decreased. We should have a light patrol tomorrow and recover. Why did she think morale has decreased? Because Vasquez has sweaty drawers? And in the final one, 
Day 13. Vasquez continues to complain about the patrol times and duration. If this continues, disciplinary action may be warranted. Dawson has become routinely late to our 0600 report-in. I'll bring this up with him on the next occurrence. Both Maria and Vasquez mentioned a man named Dawson, but we don't find Dawson's body here. However, we know exactly where to find him. In the first holotape we read, the Sentinel System Log, we learned that at least one suit of the Sentinel Power Armor escorted Dawson to the Schult Propane Station. What's strange about this is the system log on the unit that we recovered gives us the indication that it was the two Sentinel systems we found here and destroyed that killed Vasquez and Maria. Looking at the log again, it says, activating new targeting protocol by authorization of Scribe Dawson. Then we see the surprise of Vasquez and Maria, and then the system log reads, threat status eliminated. So Scribe Dawson changed the Sentinel system's targeting parameters to target Vasquez and Maria? Why? To find out, we must head to the Schult propane stand. We know exactly where this is because coincidentally I covered it in my most recent video on unmarked locations that you can watch here. As we approach, we see a man in power armor fighting with a raider. But as we get closer, he turns his tension upon us. He is legendary and his name is Dawson. Every shot counts. Racing inside to kill the raider. With both enemies dead, we can inspect Dawson's corpse. On his body, we find Dawson's footlocker key. And because he was legendary, we find a randomly generated legendary item. Heading back inside the propane stand, we find some new stuff here that we did not find. When we explored this propane stand in another video, we see two ammo boxes on the counter, surrounded by fusion cells and a fusion core. And Dawson has placed a Brotherhood of Steel flag on the wall. After looting the cash registers and the Nuka-Cola machine, we can loot the Raider's duffel bag on the ground and turning around, we find another copy of Hot Rodder magazine. You've collected an issue of Hot Rodder. Permanently unlock a new custom paint job for your power armor and pit boy. Racing stripes. So these are the two new paint schemes that we read about, Outcast and Hot Rodder. I'll show off both in greater detail a little bit later. But using the key, we can unlock the Foot Locker, where we find Dawson's Holotape and the Sentinel Program Mission Report. We'll start by reading the Sentinel Program Mission Report. Two items, the first one, Sentinel Power Armor Overview. The Sentinel Control System is an AI-based unmanned power armor control system developed jointly by West Tech and General Atomics International. This highly experimental system was developed in the lead up to the Great War to supplement normal military deployments by utilizing existing power armor units. This technology was then recovered by the Brotherhood of Steel following the war. Continued experiments focus on the use of Sentinels in fully unmanned missions. Well, it makes sense we would find something like this on Dawson's inventory. After all, he and Vasquez were both scribes. This kind of historical documentation about technology is, after all, very important to the Brotherhood of Steel. Autonomous Mission Report 001, our first unmanned mission experiment, utilizes a Sentinel unit with AI tuned for advanced friend slash foe discrimination, as well as highly effective threat elimination drive. This mission also tests human interaction and reception of a more commanding personality matrix. The mission objective was to patrol a 0.5 mile radius and perform routine peacekeeping operations. However, the test unit has proven to be far too aggressive. It has engaged persons nearby that exhibit only the slightest hint of hostility. We have attempted unsuccessfully to initiate a remote shutdown. The unit will have to be manually decommissioned. So there's another AI-controlled Sentinel unit wandering around somewhere out there. Sounds like it's already killed a few non-hostiles. After everything they say about the dangers of technology, the Brotherhood isn't taking very good care to make sure their technology doesn't hurt others. We'll have to track this unit down, but first, we can read Dawson's holotape. Dawson Wakefield, scribe. In the first item, sending data, this is the third week I've been sending data to the Institute. Schematics, core dumps, everything. The Brotherhood has amassed an enormous amount of data and technology, and yet we keep it locked away. We say it's to keep us safe, to protect humanity from itself. 
I've had enough of the hubris and greed, so I'm going to keep doing this as long as I can. I'm starting to think this is my true purpose. So Dawson was an Institute spy. But how closely was Dawson working with the Institute? Did they know him on a first name basis? Or was he just sending them anonymous information? In the next one, backups, Maria caught me compiling a holotape today. I told her I was just making backups. She seemed to accept that. I'll need to be more careful. In the next one, questions. Vasquez is starting to ask a lot of questions. I can't even take a leak without him asking for a full status report. This is getting out of control. And in the final one, patrol. There's going to have to be an accident. It's the only way I can keep all of this quiet. I know how to reprogram the Sentinel targeting systems. I'll say that I barely made it out alive, that all the kinks with the AI haven't been worked out yet. I'll wipe my own Sentinel's memory when I'm done. If the Brotherhood dies, too much will die with us. I can't allow it. My Sentinel passcode is capital Tripwire Echo. I'll need to get Maria and Vasquez's code somehow. So Dawson reprogrammed the targeting parameters of the other two Sentinels to kill Maria and Vasquez because he's an Institute spy. He was sending the Brotherhood's information to the Institute because apparently he felt that the Brotherhood was doomed anyway and he didn't want humanity's information to die with the Brotherhood. I don't understand this thinking because if the Brotherhood dies, it will likely be killed by the Institute and then the Institute will have access to all of the Brotherhood's information anyway. And Dawson killed Maria and Vasquez because he thought they were becoming suspicious of him, but they had no idea. Vasquez even got him a new toy car for his birthday. In their minds, they were all still friends and fellow soldiers, but he betrayed them. Anyway, we can't recover the other two units because we destroyed them, so we don't have to track down those passcodes, but we do have Dawson's here, capital Tripwire Echo. And just outside the Schultz propane stand, we find a power armor frame with a couple pieces of T-45 power armor on it inside a power armor workbench. Getting closer, we find an option to hack the power armor. Accessing onboard control system, okay. Enter passcode, okay. CS override, okay. Reinitializing unit sentinel, okay. No linked user. Activate to set the current user as sentinel operator and access all system commands. Select command, activate. Do not interfere with security operations. Whoa, okay. Not at all creepy. <laughs> it looks like it's working, but it's missing some power armor. Getting close, we can activate him again. We find an option here to access storage and modify loadout. And to the right of him, we see his two missing pieces of power armor, the right leg and the left arm. So activating him again, we can access the storage and modify loadout, and it works just like a companion trade menu. We can place the power armor on his inventory and press T to equip it. And there we go, a fully equipped AI-controlled suit of power armor. But let's see what other options we have here. Enter standby mode, that likely causes him to hold still, and then select personality matrix. We see that the sentry bot personality is default, that's the voice we just heard upon activation. So let's try the Mr. Gutsy personality. Do I look like I have time for idle chit chat? Ah ha ha ha! Ah, oh, that's my favorite, I think. But let's see what else we've got here. We can choose the Assaultron personality. Human on deck. Attention. If we want a creepy dominatrix companion like Cleo. And we find another one here, but it says memory free. Clicking it doesn't really do anything. We'll go ahead and set this guy to Mr. Gutsy for now. But next, we need to hunt down and destroy the Rogue Sentinel. Remember, we read in the holotape that we found on Dawson that the Brotherhood lost a unit. It went haywire and started killing people. Thankfully, the holotape pinpoints its location on our map. Walking south-southwest of the Schultz propane stand, we find the Rogue unit as we approach Relay Tower OBB 915. was fighting a bunch of dogs on his body, we find the Sentinel Personality Matrix Liberty Prime. 
Oh no. And another full suit of Brotherhood Outcast T-45. And nearby, we see the handiwork of this unit. We find a dead settler, another mongrel dog, a dead radstag doe, a dead attack dog, a raider, another raider, and two more raiders. And then off to the south, a scavenger and a servo mech scrap bot. Goodness, the Sentinel really tore stuff up. But now that we've unlocked this final personality, we can activate the unit and program it to adopt the personality of Liberty Prime. Victory is assured. Marvelous. Well, we've collected everything. Now to take it all back to the shop to inspect it. We can swap the Sentinel's power armor with any suit we want. I'm going to pilfer this T-51 Vim suit from my power armor museum. And to equip it onto our Sentinel, we just activate him, open the trade dialog, and equip it the same way as we would equip any armor on his inventory. Look at that, he looks great. And we can equip him with any weapon. Fat Man Gatling Laser. I decided to give him a harpoon gun. He functions like a companion, but he doesn't replace our companion. So as you see here, I'm running around with both Preston Garvey and the Sentinel AI set. And as for carrying capacity, it seems to be pretty balanced. In this example, I have two full suits of power armor on his inventory, one that he's wearing and another that he's carrying, and I finally exceeded his carrying capacity. So even if you don't want to use him in combat, he could simply be a walking frame that you use as a pack mule. Now as for the two new power armor paint schemes, the first is the Outcast suit, which looks exactly like the Outcast power armor we remember from the Capital Wasteland, and it works on every suit of power armor, T45, T51, T60, and X01. Painting all pieces gives us an intelligence bonus. The other suit is the Racing Stripe suit. This is a solid blue paint scheme with a big white racing stripe down the middle. All pieces painted increases our agility. Sadly, the Outcast paint scheme does not come with a matching Pip-Boy paint scheme that I was able to find, but the Racing Stripe paint scheme does have a Pip-Boy version. However, I don't know if it should be called Racing Stripe because the Pip-Boy version is just a royal blue. There are two little white stripes on the back of it, but they're really hard to see and they're small. We don't see it while using the Pip-Boy, and even in third-person view, this back part of the Pip-Boy is held against the character's body. The only way I was able to observe it was by jumping in the air and then freezing my character so I could zoom in to see the stripe. Now that we've fully explored the Sentinel Control System Companion, let's go over a few criticisms. Overall, I'm really pleased with this creation. The quest was interesting from a lore perspective. I'd love to learn more about how the outcasts were reabsorbed into the Brotherhood of Steel after Maxon came to power. This little story gives us a brief snippet of information, and it's welcome. I also like the way this quest was packaged. In some of the other creations, we purchase them and then get the quest with a new quest destination marked on our map. I don't like that because we don't have a lore reason for going to that destination. Go to South Boston and find the dog. Well, okay, but how did we learn that the dog was there? Well, because an omnipotent game master or narrator told us and marked it on our map. That's an immersion-breaking form of storytelling. This way makes much more sense. We find a signal that we pick up on our Pip-Boy. That's credible, and it gives us a great segue into the quest. The execution, however, was really frustrating. If every person who buys this creation starts their game in Sanctuary, then there's no problem. They're gonna pick up the distress signal and run south until they find the Sentinel suits. But what about players who make homes that are far away from the conquered area? Like me. My character's home is on the east coast of the Commonwealth. After installing the creation and starting the quest, and even after listening to the distress beacon, I still had no idea where I needed to go. I didn't get a compass marker, I didn't get a map marker, and the distress beacon was so far away that it was too weak for me to pick up on my Pip-Boy. I was lucky that I ran west, which happened to be the right direction. I could have ran north or south. 
Had I done either of those two things, I would have been exploring the Commonwealth for hours trying to find this distress beacon. Now I suppose it's possible that I have some mod install that was hiding the compass and map markers. However, I made sure to uninstall all interface mods just to rule out that issue. And I even watched videos of other players playing through this creation and they had the same issue. I never saw any map markers on their compass or their Pip-Boy map. So I don't think it's just me, but I could be wrong about that. The execution of this quest would have been much better if the radius of the signal was map-wide. If you could stand anywhere in the Commonwealth and still pick up a signal even if it's really, really faint. That way we can at least start running in the right direction. But once we find the Sentinel suits, everything goes smoothly. I'm a little disappointed that we don't find unique dialogue with this suit, but I understand why they did it. They reused the voices of existing robots in the game because it not only saved time, it was easier to implement, but also because it's less to download, which is really important for console players. So yeah, it would have been cool if they got an actor to do a new recording of a new voice, but I understand why they did it this way. I'm really surprised that this suit of power armor doesn't count as a companion. I worry about that breaking the delicate balance of the game. After all, the developers originally intended the sole survivor to be able to walk around with any companion, plus dog meat. That's the way it was in Fallout 3. We were able to have dog companions with human companions in Fallout New Vegas, and that was their intention with Fallout 4. They even had dialogue options recorded for companions to interact with dog meat, but they ultimately chose against doing that because they felt that it would break the balance of the game, that the sole survivor with a companion and a dog wouldn't be challenged enough. And so without mods, we can't run around with both a companion and dog meat. But with this creation, we can have a companion and a full suit of AI-controlled power armor that can wield any weapon the sole survivor can. I think that suit of AI-controlled power armor would be much more powerful than dog meat. So if having a companion and dog meat breaks the balance of the game, how does this creation not? The biggest issue with this creation that I see is that we already have it. There are already no fewer than two mods available that give us an AI-controlled power armor companion. Let me show both to you so that we can go over the differences. The first is Power Armor Autopilot by Kentington. This was published on January 12th, 2016. It's a popular mod that has been downloaded over 57,000 times to date. And here's how it works. After installing the mod, go to a chemistry station. If we scroll down to utilities, we find a new section allowing us to craft a Power Armor AI module. After crafting the module, we walk up to any suit of Power Armor and initiate the transfer dialog. We find the AI module in the apparel section of our inventory and we simply transfer it. We can have up to three AI-controlled suits of power armor at any given time. After transferring the AI module, we have to assign this particular suit to a slot. We'll assign this suit to slot A, then crafting a new AI module from a chemistry station, we'll assign this suit to slot B, and then assign this one to slot C. We now have three Power Armor Companions following us around the Commonwealth, and that's in addition to the one we get from the creation. So the good thing is this creation doesn't conflict with existing mods that give us a Power Armor Companion. As you can see in this example, I'm running around with <laughs> Preston Garvey and four suits of AI-controlled Power Armor, which is just insane. This mod also comes with a unique thing we don't find in the creation. Back at the chemistry station, we find an option to craft power armor signal relay grenades. We can craft one for each suit individually, A, B, or C, and we can craft a grenade that relays in all three suits. Now, taking this out for a spin, I did find that having so many companions broke pathing. A little bit. I don't think this is a problem with either the mod or the creation, but rather a limitation of the game. I just don't think the game was designed for us to have so many followers. Although, that said, there are some quests where we have to escort NPCs, but I found that only one or two suits were able to stick with me as I walked around the Commonwealth. Arriving at Dunwich Borers, we can use the relay grenade to relay each suit of armor in one by one. After the grenade detonates, it lets off a big red flare, and then... I 
<laughs> in a really cool effect, the suit of power armor appears in the sky and then falls down to the ground. Let's try one more time, a little bit closer this time. <laughs> and all three suits of power armor are devastating these raiders. This is, of course, in addition to the suit that came with the creation. I forgot to put weapons on these three, so they're doing melee damage, but the one that came with the creation is attacking with a laser rifle. We can use the grenades to maneuver these companions anywhere we want. I'm going to take the all suits grenade and toss it into the middle of the mine. and they come down one by one. <laughs> That's really cool. Now, besides that major difference, another major difference between the creation and Kentington's mod is that Kentington's suits do take damage. As you see, all three suits of power armor are already missing pieces. Any suit of power armor we equip on these guys is gonna need constant repair. That's much more realistic, but it's a huge bummer, creating a big hassle for us. Here I am storming Dunwich Boars, and after this, I'm gonna have to fully repair three broken suits of X01 power armor, which is gonna be really expensive. But taking a look at the creation, we see that the T51 suit I put on him is still fully intact. He doesn't take damage. Also, we can attack the Kentington suit of power armor and deal damage. If we do, he eventually turns hostile, and it can be killed. Control database accessed. Quoting New England poet Robert Frost, Freedom lies in being bold. If one of Kentington's suits is destroyed, we lose the power armor frame, but we can loot the broken pieces of power armor from the frame's inventory. We also get the power armor AI module so we can transfer it to another suit. However, from my tests, the one that comes with the creation is indestructible like a companion. No matter how many times I shot at this guy, none of the armor was damaged, he didn't die, and he didn't turn hostile. If we use the all power armor suits relay grenade after one of our suits has died, it only relays in the two suits still alive. So it's a really well polished mod. The other mod I found that was similar to this creation is Vickioris's Patriot Power Armor Companion. Vickioris was inspired by Kentington's mod. He published his a few months after Kentington in August of 2016. But his mod functions in a much different way, and it comes with a quest. After installing the Patriot Power Armor AI Companion mod, we get a new quest called The Call of the Patriot. Listen to emergency frequency r 11 h Much like with the Creation Club creation, we find a new radio signal on our Pip-Boy. But this one is voiced. To any military personnel listening on this frequency, Please report to the research and development bunker northwest of Sentinel Site Prescott. We require assistance. It appears a nuclear detonation has occurred not too far from us and we are trapped. Please report us at. This message will self-repeat. So it sounds like a message from someone sent just after the nuclear detonation of 2077. Inspecting our Pip-Boy, we find a brand new location in the glowing sea, the Research and Development Laboratory Bunker. Fast traveling there, we see that an alarm is still going off at the place these 200 years later, and the front door is guarded by three rad scorpions. After destroying the scorpions, we can open the front door to find ourselves in a beautiful, clean, well-lit bunker. There's a lot of interesting stuff around, but before we get sidetracked, we'll head to the terminal at the southern end of the bunker. This is the Project Freedom Terminal. Remember, what you see here, what you do here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here.
This terminal tells the story of the people involved in the development of the Patriot AI power armor frame. It's an interesting story, but far too long for me to cover here. If interested, you can watch me go through this terminal by clicking here. Instead, we'll get straight to activating this thing. Backing all the way out of reports, we find a new option, Read Me. If you have decided to ignore my advice and decide to activate Patriot, take my holotags that are on my desk. Otherwise, the AI will shoot you down. The final option is to unlock the safe. Backing out of the terminal, we find a wall-mounted safe and inside a fusion core and the Patriot AI chip. Now, before installing the chip, we should probably go find those holotags. There are a few desks nearby, but we don't see tags anywhere. We find them inside the executive desk against the eastern wall. With the holotags safely on our inventory, we can open the transfer dialog with the nearby suit of power armor and place the Patriot AI chip. Hey. Systems activated. Designation, Patriot. Mission, to defend the people of the United States of America. Are you this unit's commanding officer? What are you? I am a top secret project devised by the United States military. Project name, Freedom Task. Create artificial intelligence to minimize the loss of American life. My name is Patriot. I am the only prototype from Project Freedom. Are you this unit's commanding officer? No. Nope. I command you to leave this outpost at once. Will you comply? This option is not voiced. By orders of General Adams, all non-involved parties that enter the bunker must leave at once or face pacification. Will you comply? I don't think so. Civilian has not complied. Usage of Delhi Force has been authorized. <laughs> <laughs> If we choose to kill him, we find a stack of 100 fusion cores on his inventory, and we can retrieve the Patriot AI chip, as well as a Gatling laser and a full suit of T-51B power armor. So we'll have to go through this whole thing again with a different power armor frame. Or, instead of refusing to leave, we can agree to head on out. All right, I'm going. Acknowledged. But that just forces us to go through the conversation again. The other option is to be sarcastic. Will you comply? Analyzing vocal patterns. Sarcasm detected. Civilian is now considered a possible communist spy. Commencing pacification. <laughs> we recognize this line from my latest video on Fallout 4 Random Encounters, which you can watch here. But instead of breaking the AI by throwing him into a loop, we just make him mad and he turns hostile. So the other two options is to pass a difficult red speech check and say, yes, we are the commanding officer. Sure. It is an honor to serve you, commander. In which case he joins us as a companion. Or, if we have the holotags on our inventory, we find an option to say, here are my credentials, but this is unvoiced. And Patriot joins us as a companion. But this version is different from both the creation and Kentington's mod, in that he does act like a fully-fledged companion. We can't have him and Preston. You can see Preston going back to Kingsport Lighthouse. The cool thing about Patriot here is that many of his lines are voiced. I need to ask you something. Do you require assistance, Commander? How are you feeling about things? Commander, I will follow your orders without question. I trust that you will do what is right for all Americans. However, many others are not voiced at all. Choosing neutral here does nothing. The same is true for if we ask him a question. And That's we can swap out the armor he wears in the same fashion. We simply open the trade dialogue and place the new armor on his inventory. Incidentally, this bunker is also a player home. We see that it already comes with a fuse box on the wall giving us 100 power. And we can activate the nearby workbench to open settlement building mode. We can build anything we want here. 
Turning west, we find a security gate. Opening it up, we find a little bit of a storage and bunk room. Lots of ammo canisters, first aid boxes, and plenty of food. So it's pretty cool to find a little bunker-like player home in the middle of the glowing sea with this mod. Taking Patriot here out for a spin, we discover that he has a number of unique things to say in a completely unique voice during combat. And after playing with him for well over an hour, his power armor never got damaged and never fell off, and he never died, so I think he is immortal like a regular companion. So the Sentinel Creation Club creation is definitely its own thing. It's not exactly like Kentington's mod. And it's not exactly like Vickioris's Patriot mod. They're all a little bit different from each other, and they complement each other. We can use all three at the same time. To my knowledge, Kentington's mod is not available for the Xbox One or the PlayStation. I couldn't find it when I went searching for it. But Vicorius's mod, the Patriot Power Armor, is indeed available on Bethesda.net for the PC, Xbox One, and PS4. So we have exactly what I want to see. A whole lot of options. As consumers, we can choose what we want most. Do we prefer a mod like Kentington's that gives us relay grenades? Do we prefer a mod like the Patriot that gives us a more companion-like experience? Or do we prefer the Creation Club Creation, which is a little bit of a mix between the two? It's kind of a companion, but not really. It doesn't take the place of our companion. I love more options for the consumer, so I'm glad this thing exists. I have to admit, however, that once I learned that there were already mods that were similar to this creation, it did take a bit of the wind out of my sails. I don't think Bethesda did anything illegal or morally wrong by creating this creation. I'm not even saying that or going there. But what I want to see more than anything with the Creation Club is something new. Something that we haven't seen before. Something that we don't already have. And so even though I'm glad this exists, I walk away a little bit bummed. A little disappointed that this wasn't a completely original idea. That they didn't make something completely new that we hadn't already seen in some form before. That is what I think the Creation Club should be all about. That is what I think the Creation Club does best. All of my favorite things that we find on the Creation Club have never been done before, and I want to see more of that in the future. But those are just my thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, and I would love to know your thoughts. What do you think of the Sentinel Control System Companion and of the quest Malevolent Malfunction? Let me know in the comment section below. One more thing, remember in my last video on the Creation Club, I talked about all of those superhero themed Pip-Boy skins that they released individually, one after another, on a timer? Act now within the next 24 hours or it's gone forever. Well, turns out that they weren't gone forever. Bethesda, as we thought they would, has packaged all of these superhero Pip-Boy skins into a superhero-themed Pip-Boy skin bundle. Sadly, you can't purchase them individually, so if, like me, you missed only one, I missed the Grognak Pip-Boy skin, you can now get it, but you have to download and pay for the entire bundle, even if you've already paid for all of the other Pip-Boy skins. I explained why I dislike this type of marketing and product packaging in a previous video, so I won't do so again here. But Bethesda is training us with this particular event, training us to not take their exclusives and limited time offers very seriously. After all, now we know that if they come out with something in the future and they say that it's a limited time offer, act now or it's gone forever, we know that that's not true. They're going to come out with a package or a bundle later on, and so we can all save our money until they do. That, at least, is the lesson I learned. There is one other major item in this latest Creation Club release, and it's really cool. The Noir Apartments. I'll be reviewing the Noir Apartments and the quest that comes with it in tomorrow's episode, so stay tuned for that. I publish many videos each and every week, so if you want to make sure you don't miss that episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a brand new shirt in the shop. 
Who's a good boy? That's right, you can find everyone's favorite German Shepherd on a shirt that comes in a variety of both men's and women's sizes and in a wide array of colors. You can also find this design on other products as well, smartphone cases, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video. Bombs are being eliminated.